How's it going guys? Mark Burstenner here with Techno Buffalo and as you guys know I'm huge into the democratization of the smartphone market and we're very lucky today to have a handful of guests from none other than Nextbit. If you've been paying attention to the site, you've been paying attention to the internet, you might have seen the Nextbit Robin hit the webs and we're talking with some of the folks on the team. You should see them right here right now. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves? Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Tom and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Nextbit. I'm Mike, CTO and co-founder. Awesome. It's a pleasure to have you guys here and I figure we'll just get right into it. Uh, we've, we've barely heard anything but just rumblings before the Kickstarter hit. I know I saw my buddy Ryan Block tweet something about the phone. That was the first that I had heard about it. Pretty impressive you guys were able to keep it under wraps for, for quite that long, but since we don't really know all that much about you guys or about the company, why don't we just start there? Why don't you tell us about where Nextbit started and how you guys all wound up working together and where you come from? Sure, so Mike and I have actually been working together for almost eight years now, I want to say, seven or eight yeah, years. Yeah. Uh, we actually met on the Android team at Google uh, back around 2007. Uh, and so we, we, were, uh, we worked together on Android uh, through summer of 2010, so that was like after Droid, after Nexus One and everything, and then uh, left. We had a startup called 3LM uh, that we, was also doing Android stuff. Um, did that for a while, that actually ended up at Motorola, and then Google bought Motorola, so we ended up back at Google, <laughs> and then uh, then we started Nextbit. Yeah. Awesome. So you started Nextbit. How, what was that process like? What was the impetus for trying to create something like the Robin? Which, essentially, which came first, Nextbit or the Robin? Nextbit. Nextbit, yeah. And it's actually Mike's original concept. You want to talk a little bit about kind of the beginning of the company and the vision? Yeah, so or, this is maybe around 2000, I want to say 2011 or 2012, somewhere in that time frame. I, I became really addicted to Angry Birds. I just got really obsessed with that game, and uh, being a, a gadget enthusiast myself, I loved to upgrade to the latest and greatest devices, and I actually found it very frustrating. I couldn't understand why, why when I upgrade to a new phone, I lost all my levels. I actually found myself not wanting to upgrade to the latest and greatest phones, and I started thinking more like, you know, looking at the physical realities of where technology is today, connectivity, you know, the processing power of my devices, the cloud, all that, I could, I, it didn't seem... I, I felt like, at least from the software perspective, all this should be possible, right? And really, what if you kind of like took the cloud and really embedded it into the OS itself to provide a, a more seamless experience, not just for transitioning between your devices, but in a way, you could even exceed the specs of your device. Like, you should never have to worry about running out of space on your phone. I, I, found, it, I found it kind of silly that every time I went to go take a video or a picture and my phone was out of space, I would get this error message and I had, you know, hundreds of gigs in Dropbox, I had one terabyte of space in Google Drive, and I had all this cloud storage, but I was still running into storage problems. And this kind of, you know, really led us to, to Nextbit. So, that sounds, I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. Let's talk about the software for just a minute. You know, you decided this is a solution that you wanted to come up with, a problem that you wanted to solve. What was your approach in terms of hitting Android, trying to take that, gutting out the things you didn't need, and sticking stuff that you needed inside of it? What was your approach in terms of how much you wanted to change, how close to stock you wanted to stay, and things of that nature? Yeah, I mean, coming from Android team, we didn't really want to change anything more than we really needed to, right? So, and I think part of that is having that understanding of of the system, having you know shipped 1.0 and worked on it for numerous years. So in terms of a technology approach, we really wanted to focus on where the key areas that we want to just improve upon to enable this type of experience. And let's just tackle that. Other areas, let's leave it as stock as possible because there's a lot of great stuff that the team in Mountain View has worked on. Uh, other people have contributed to the open source project and we should leverage that. Like there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, stick with what works, that makes perfect sense. So what can we kind of expect to see in terms of the changes that you have made? What's what's kind of like the biggest departure that we're gonna find in, in the Robin OS? Is, the, is there a name, by the way? No, we haven't uh, actually named the OS. It really is, it's, it's Android with with uh, some modifications and enhancements and what we call smart storage, right? So what, 
you know, the, the modifications we make, they're, we like to call them surgical modifications, right, in the framework. We try and touch as little as possible, and we try and, and leave the experience as stock as possible, but there is a different paradigm here, right? So the way, you know, Mike was talking about, you know, there's cloud storage today, you have Dropbox, you have Google Drive, you have a bunch of solutions, um, but they don't actually fundamentally solve the problem of not having you run out of space on your phone because they're essentially desktop era solutions, right? These are all, um, you know, concepts or products that got developed to solve desktop time solutions of like, I have a file on my work PC, I want to access it on my home laptop when I'm watching a movie or something like that. They weren't really built, you know, with mobile in mind to start with. So smart storage for us is kind of like the next generation. It's like, okay, on a mobile phone, I'm not thinking about, well, I have a, a file system with folders and directory and I'm going to go in and open a folder and that's going to be my folder of things that I can also see in my other, you know, on my PC or things like that, right? On phones, you have apps and you have multimedia, like pictures and videos that you take, right? And you run out of space, right? Uh, and so how do we solve that problem, right? And so all of the, the tweaks that we've made, they're either, you know, operating system, you know, framework level changes that enable hooks or they're UI changes that let you understand that, hey, you know, in the beginning you're using your phone, it's just like a normal phone. Eventually you're gonna run out of space like everybody does on their phones. At that point, it's gonna be a little bit different because we're gonna intelligently move things off of your phone. Uh, that we think you don't need anymore. For example, we'll downsample old photos. But right? you'll have screen resolution on the device, but the full res will be in the cloud. Or we'll make, we'll, we'll take off APKs, but we'll leave a shadowed out icon. You'll see that in the demo in, in a little bit later, right? Where it's kind of grayed out. And so the experience we're trying to say is, you don't have this storage locker in the cloud that you move things to and from. You just have your phone. And when you're offline or you're not trying to access the cloud or anything. Your phone is your 32 gigs of local and anything that's on it, whatever you do. But when you're online, your phone is actually now a 100 gigabyte phone. And it's all there if you want to access it, right? So you can always tap on a grayed out icon and the app will be there. And you don't lose any progress in your state. You don't lose your Angry Bird levels. Yep. You don't have to log back into any app, right? It's all there, right? And so that's this required a little bit of a different UI to just make that really clear. And so that's essentially all the changes we've made is around that. So what is the what what is the number like if you had just one sentence to tell a potential backer what the number one biggest change to the UI is what is that one big difference that we're going to notice? Well, it's launcher. Yeah, yeah, we have a I custom know. launcher which is kind of and you'll see that it just helps us convey when an app is moved to the cloud and when it's downloaded. Cool. So how how is that going to work with other, you know, some of the big customization features of Android in terms of uh, being able to install something like Nova Launcher, for example. Good question. Yeah, we're actually we it'll it'll work with Nova Launcher. We have a, a scheme that works with that too. Yeah. Right. We have a scheme to support third party. So third party launchers are okay, uh, and and you can still use our, our smart storage, and you'll still see the shadow icons. In addition, we've gone a little bit further. Uh, one, of course, everything we do on the phone is optional, right? You don't have to do any of these clouds if you don't want to. We think it'll once you run out of space, like you know, trust me, you want it. But all right, you may you may not want it front. That's fine. Um, but two, you know what, you might not want anything we've done, but it, you know, we're Android enthusiasts. Uh, we like, you know, um, the spirit that we did Android in originally, you know, of this open source, people doing what they want. So we've actually unlocked the bootloader on our device, right? So when it ships, it'll ship an unlocked bootloader. And we're going to honor the warranty for people, even if they flash other ROMs on our phones. We're not going to, so right now, every manufacturer, even with unlocked bootloaders, they'll void your warranty if you flash something else on the phone because you might break it. For us, we're going to honor that, right? Because Mike's a hardcore hacker. Yeah, yeah. He finds all his devices. Yeah. Um, he actually did an Easter egg uh, back in the Droid days. You, you put an Easter egg. Yeah, I, I, I snuck in an overclock feature in the original Motorola Droid, the very last minute. I loved. Hey, first of all, I loved that phone. Second, that's awesome. Third, you 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 leapfrogged me. That was actually a question that I had for a little bit later on. So why don't we just tackle that right now, really quickly? I was just kind of curious, you know, what's your thinking in terms of selling the device with a bootloader unlocked? Like, obviously, I hear that end of in terms of the users being able to do what they want with the devices. We're Android enthusiasts. I get it. Um, but it kind of feels like that's a little bit of a bummer uh, to not have what you guys are building, at least a bummer for you guys, what you guys are building that really makes it a differentiator. Um, so kind of what is your, your perspective on that? And kind of that leads into the next question, which is, do you guys have any plans to bring this kind of functionality to maybe a ROM of your own or anything that might breach uh, devices other than the Robin? Sure. So yeah, I'll take the first part. So it, it's weird, right? We, 
when we did this, we, we really wanted to make sure every decision we made, uh, we can answer with, is this what's best for the user, right? Like, and it sounds cheesy and corporate, but it's really not, right? It's really where it comes from, where we come from. And so, you know, we're doing this phone. We're really enthusiastic about doing a phone like this direct to consumer, right? So we're not going through carriers, right? We're going direct to the end user. And it's tough, it's really hard, right? It's hard cell phone, people can't go in a store and touch and feel and all that. But the benefits are really big, right? One, you can get a device out much faster if you're not going through carriers. Two, right. it's cheaper It's cheaper in multiple levels, and so we can actually sell it at a cheaper price, right? So you save, you as a user, save 100 plus dollars just because we can sell it to you directly. And three, we can make it any way we want to. There's no bloat, there's no 34 apps that you have to pre-install from the carrier. There's no, you can't have this feature because it, you know, uh, maybe it's a void feature or whatever, like there's nothing cut, right? And so we're like, this, this is empowering us to, this business model empowers us to really make a device for the customer when, you know, we, so when our last startup got acquired by Motorola and we were there, it was really weird for us because when we first joined, you know, we sat in a lot of meetings uh, where they said, you know, well, the customer wants this and the customer wants that. And I'm like, why would, why would people want that? And it took me a while to realize that when they say customer, they mean carriers, right? They mean like, oh, you know, the carrier wants that. They don't want VoIP or, you know what I mean? It's like, they're like, oh, okay, that's what they mean, right? And so we're like, no, no, we're going to be different. We're going to be 100% about just making the product. So we really want to be like, is this what's best? And we know, like, we think our features are awesome. We want people to use them. But it's your phone. Like, why? It's just silly. Like, do whatever you want with your phone, man. Like, you paid for it. It's yours. I don't want to have a say in what you do with your phone. Um, you know, so it just comes from that philosophy of, like, is this what's best for the user? We will. But to answer the second part, I think, you know, look, it's, it's right now we, we built the software off of AOSP, and that's what we're shipping on the devices. Uh, I think as the team grows over time and there's popular mods out there, uh, we'd love to see if we have resources to become maintainers ourselves of our builds, you know, for this hardware. Uh, but we don't have any current plans, unfortunately, to bring our software to other devices. That's just a whole, you know, whole other company just do that. <laughs> so for right now, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, the benefits of our hardware. Makes perfect sense. Well. I would love to hear a little bit more about that software. Um, it, it, Mike, if you could speak just a little bit to, you know, obviously I don't want you guys to, to spill a jar of your secret sauce, but if you could give me a little bit of insight into kind of how you guys know which devices I'm not using, or is it something quite so simple as looking and seeing when the last time it was used was, or are you guys doing something a little bit more intense than that? Yeah, um, well, if you'd like, we can jump into a, a little software demo, and I can also talk about about how the software works while we're doing that. That's I I think I would uh, I think I would very much enjoy that, and I think our viewers would enjoy that too. Let's let's jump into that. So I'm gonna switch to the camera. Um, so you're seeing Android 5.1 5.1.1 Lollipop here, and we are working on the port to M already. So due to hardware schedule, we're, in, we're anticipating that the first batch will ship with Lollipop, and those users should expect an M update to follow in just weeks, and then the rest will ship with M. So you're going to see the, the launcher here. Here are all my apps. I've been using my phone for several months, about eight months or so, and it's running out of space. I will simply swipe to my panels here, and you're going to notice this screen looks a little bit different. For some apps. You're going to notice Spotify, TED, and Skype, and I'll show you here, are a little bit grayed out. And this is what we call a shadow icon. So what actually happened is because my phone was running out of space, my phone intelligently adapts to me as a user. So it actually recognizes what are my favorite apps, what are the apps I'm using, when I'm using them. And when I run out of space, it can actually free up space for me right then and there. So let's just say that today, you know, because I haven't used Spotify in eight months, I'm more of a Pandora user myself, but you're telling me there's a great promotion on Spotify, we need to check it out. I can simply tap on Spotify here, and you'll see the download progress bar kick in, and you'll also see the color of the icon start to, 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 to fade in as we're downloading and installing. Now, as a user, we always want to come back to control for the user. What's best for the user, as Tom kind of pointed out. So we always give you the option, if you click this little fab button here, we always give you the option to pin your apps. So even if I haven't used Spotify in 
nine or ten months, I can still pin the application to my device. So if I'm running out of space, we'll make sure that app is always there. And if I'm ever curious which apps are actually in the cloud or not, I can click on this little cloud icon here, and we can see these are my apps in the cloud. But let's go back to Spotify, and let's launch it. And you're going to notice that with Spotify, I didn't have to type in my username or password again. I was literally able to pick up exactly where I left off eight months ago when I last used it. So that's the experience when you want to pull that back down from the cloud. The next thing I'm going to show you is I think we've all been in a scenario where we are either at a park, at a concert, you want to take a picture or video and your phone is full and you get that error message. You're out of storage. So we're going to take a video here. I'm going to open up my camera application and I will film a pretty boring video. Sorry, this is. Uh, I'm just going to tilt it up here, and we'll just keep it. That's, that's my favorite kind of video. I, I love. Yeah. Um, so I'll talk a little bit a little bit about how the tech works while I'm just filming this 30 second video. So what happens is when your phone is plugged in and when you're connected to Wi-Fi, we will back up your apps and your photos. We actually synchronize those to the cloud. So we do this in particular because we want to make sure that we don't impact both your, your data plan as well as your battery life. And once we back these up, the phone actually knows now which apps have been synchronized to the cloud. So when you're running out of space, whether you're in a tunnel or an airplane, it can actually make a very intelligent decision based off of your usage patterns and the last time it synced with the cloud. So when it's actually freeing up space, it doesn't need to upload data at that moment in time. Right. Seems like it's it's not unlike uh, throwing something into your trash if you use a Mac. You're essentially marking it for deletion once you've actually emptied your trash. Right, right. So I just in my video. And let's go back to the screen. And we're going to notice a couple more apps have been essentially offloaded. So we can also check this little notification here. Floppy Birds and Twitter were offloaded. And this is because I haven't played Floppy Birds in a while. But Nobody I can always... has. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I can always use the tap on this icon here to bring it back down. And it's going to come down and it will install. And this last bit I'm going to show you is how do I access my photos, right? So as Tom mentioned, we do we look at both photos and apps, and when we decide to free up space, or actually it's really when your phone decides it needs to free up space, what will happen is it will actually generate a screen size thumbnail on your device, and it will free up the original version in the cloud. Now, because we're connected to Wi-Fi, um, I can choose to attach the original image the same way as I've always done. I just open up to open up Gmail, go to new, attach file. I can look at my recents, and you'll notice this is the video I just filmed, but here's a bunch of images that I have not looked at in a while, and these have been offloaded. And I can simply attach an image of this yellow car. Now what's going to happen is because I'm connected to Wi-Fi, it will actually fetch the original image and embed it within Gmail. And you'll notice that we didn't have to provide an SDK. There was no additional work. I didn't have to open up Dropbox or SugarSync, find the image and share it into Gmail. I could just open up Gmail as I normally would and attach the image. If I were on my LTE connection um, or just away from Wi-Fi, what will happen is instead we'll prompt the user and say, hey, would you like to download 3.9 megabytes? And for some people, maybe you're on an unlimited data plan or your company is paying for your data, 3.9 megs is fine. And for others, if you're on a 2 gigabyte T-Mobile data plan, maybe you don't want to use 3.9 megs and you just want to use the locally cached version. So we always come back and give control to the user when and how you want to use your data, but it all comes back to, you know, having an intelligent device that really adapts itself for you based off of how you're using it.
That looks fantastic. Thank you so much for that quick look. Uh, that's, I, I believe that's not something that we've seen before, the ability to attach an image. So that's really cool. That kind of leads into a handful of, of my, my next questions. Um, I mean, one of them you kind of covered. So how quickly can I get something back from the cloud if I find that it's something that I need? Um, you, you basically just showed me in real time how long it would take. My last question as it pertains to software is, is really, if you were speaking directly to a potential backer or someone who just picked up the device, and, and they stop and say to you, you know, like a handful of my colleagues, for example, in the office have, have brought this up. What are, what are your, what's your position in terms of, you know, assaging the concerns of the folks who, who might say, uh, but what, you know, what if I can't get to it? You know, what, what if I'm, I'm driving, I'm on a road trip and, and I don't have an internet connection and I can't get to the thing that I need. And, and now I, I'm, I'm just up a creek with no paddle. Yeah, so it's interesting, right? Uh, I mean, people forget that this only kicks in when you're already run out of local storage or you're just about to, right? So, you know, the answer is, well, what do you do when your phone is out of storage now, right? You delete something uh, and, you know, you, you move it to the cloud or you just delete it. You move, you uninstall applications or you delete uh, old multimedia um, to make space and you actually have to do it constantly, right? We did a bunch of research when we started about, you know, how, how big of a problem is that people are out of space and it's extremely common. Um, it happens pretty much to everybody is the answer. And when it does, it's not a one-time thing, right? You don't just like, oh, I ran out of space, let me delete stuff, okay, now I'm good forever. It's like, no, you know what, another week or two, uh, you know, if you're like me, you have kids, like another three hours later, you're like, okay, I'm out of space again. Right, it's constantly yep. Yep. managing it. So, you know, so one, you know, again, what we do is the better version, it's the better alternative to, well, you've had to delete a bunch of stuff manually, and two, Remember, like Mike said, when you first buy your phone and start using it, nothing about it is different, right? I mean, well, it's an awesome phone and you're gonna feel really good about yourself, but except for that, uh, nothing about it is different. Uh, it's, but it's just backing stuff up when it's, when it's on Wi-Fi and connected to power, right? So you don't even necessarily notice it. Uh, the LED lights in the back will kind of go off to let you know it's happening, but, but other than that, nothing, you know, it's just a normal phone you're using it, right? And all this time though, it is learning, right? It's learning like which apps you use, it's learning about your behaviors, things like that. and then. You know, if, if we do our job right, by the time you're running out of 32 gigs, let's say six months after you buy the phone, you know, we'll have a pretty good understanding of, of what it is we should keep. You know, so photos over 90 days, let's say you have a bunch of those, right? Uh, we're not even deleting them completely. We're, we're just downsampling, right? So you'll still have screen res locally. It's only if you want to attach it or if you want to zoom in, right, that you'll need to download the full res again, right? And so is that, you know, is that really going to be that big of a problem if, if you're disappointed? It's not, you know what I mean? It's a very unusual use case where you'd be like, oh my God, I can't zoom in on this photo, you know, to, to see this, this detail or things like that. We just don't think um, if anything, like, of course it's possible, but we think if we do our job right, there shouldn't be a lot of the disappointing moments, right? And we'll get better over time. Like, you know, this is, this is, this is a learning for us as well about uh, how people use the product and whether or not it's, it's meeting the goals, but we'll be super attentive. We'll be engaging with the community to make sure that we're doing a good job and implementing any feedback that people have like as soon as we can. Great, beautiful, honest answer. Let's let's switch gears just for a minute here. I just want to talk about uh, the hardware for just a second. Uh, I have a couple of questions pertaining to it. Um, you've been working with Foxconn for manufacturing. Awesome, I take it. You know, a lot of your relationships from your previous positions helped out a lot there. Um, I just wanted to cover just a handful of little things that I know our, our readers are going to want to know, our, our viewers are going to want to know, especially with respect to the specs. So just wanted to start with the processor, the brains of the operation. Um, what made you guys go with the 808? Obviously the 810 has gotten a little bit of flack lately for some heat issues, and I know that you guys are trying to keep a cap on cost. So I was just wondering kind of what was the impetus for going with the 808 specifically over maybe something a little bit cheaper even, uh, and what, what kind of, uh, what compromises that that might have brought into the equation? Sure, so yeah, I mean, uh, I might get into the specifics of the hows and whys, but this kind of goes back, sorry, again to like, is this what's best for the user? And sort of also like, what we want in a phone, right? It's kind of like, it's kind of a, yeah, look, we started a company to make a phone. We want to make a phone that we want to use, right? first and foremost. Yeah. So everything yeah. we did was kind of just the common sense of like, okay, here's the total package, here's the display, here's the resolution, you know, here's the battery size. Like, how do we make this the best total package? And so you just kind of make the decision based on like those factors together. Like, if there's features that are not necessary, 
you know, that because they, we literally can't use them on our display resolution, we just don't do them, right? But I don't know, sorry. Yeah, no, so 808, um, you know, we looked at, especially when we're designing the phone in the beginning, we knew first we wanted five to 5.2 inch screen, right? We just wanted something that fit well in your hand. And because of that, then that sort of dictated, well, what's the screen resolution that you want? And we decided, you know, 1080p is actually a really great resolution for that. We could go to QHD+, plus, but the power impact was going to be significant. We also knew we wanted all day battery life, but we didn't want a phone that's super thick. And we wanted phenomenal performance that would provide us all these characteristics. So the 808, when looking at all these things, actually was the a really great choice. Plus, it was actually a very mature chipset at the time, too. So you can just get better power improvements, better yield rates, you know, less chance of bugs, all that stuff. That's a really big point that I really want to point out, not just uh, to, for, for other folks in your positions, other companies trying to, to make some big changes, but for our readers, that's one thing that a lot of folks don't think about. You know, that's, that's something that also makes a lot of sense from an engineering perspective when you're talking about software. You know, what kind of uh, language do you want to build with? You know, you want to build with something that has a little bit of staying power, something that has a little bit of maturity behind it. And I think going with an 808 uh, is something that gives you guys a little bit of stability. And I think that's something that our viewers would be wise to, to think about and consider. You know, that, that sets us up as users uh, for the best possible experience. You know, there's something to be said uh, for not being on the bleeding edge when appropriate. So uh, let's, let's, let's jump uh, through just a little bit. There's this kind of newish category. I've been calling it the value category in my, in my videos. Uh, it's, it's somewhere between, you know, and I feel like OnePlus started it uh, with the OnePlus One. Uh, actually, that's not even true. The, the Nexus line started it. So in reality, you guys got exactly what you guys were after because now we're at the point where you can make a phone and sell it for a reasonable price off contract and unlocked. Um, so on that, in that particular category, you guys are just on the higher end of the spectrum in terms of MSRP. So I was kind of curious if you guys had done a little bit of hands-on time with kind of the other devices that are in that particular category at the moment, like the OnePlus 2, the Zenfone 2, uh, and a handful of the other ones that are coming out. I don't know if you guys have gotten a chance to play with the Moto X Pure just yet, um, but I, I was curious how you guys feel the Robin stands up uh, when you pit it next to these other devices that are in the same price range. Yeah, so we're actually, yeah, of course, um, so yes to everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cool. Let's just wrap it up. We're good. We're done. Yeah, we'll just leave now. No, so so yeah. yes, uh, this is a continuation of, of what uh, the Android team was doing with Nexus, right? Uh, bringing that direct to consumer, so you get the latest and freshest like version of Android without any bloat, you know, at the cheapest price because there's no channel, uh, you know, margin you have to give for the carriers or things like that. Um, and we're really happy to see that that category kind of take off. We think OnePlus did a fantastic job. Right, uh, of really kind of scaling that. Uh, Xiaomi, obviously not in the US, uh, Europe and kind of the other markets that we're heading to, but in their markets, right, fabulous job of, of building a massive actual following and tons of units uh, under, this, under this model, right, of direct-to-consumer uh, and kind of iterating on software quickly and, and not trying to drive a lot of uh, margin on the, on the hardware, right? Um, and so we think it's absolutely a growing category. We think it's, it, it's a, it makes a lot of sense. You know, I think um, people underestimate you know, on the, on the iPhone side of the house, right, on iOS, there's there's two things that affect the price uh, on, on iOS that, that shouldn't, uh, or for, this, for the most part, not true on Android. So one is, you know, iOS is, is firmly established successfully as kind of a luxury brand, right, which has a premium, right? So you pay more for a Louis Vuitton bag or a Rolex watch or whatever it is, right? And that's fine. And no Android OEM has really captured that, except maybe Samsung, and they spend a lot to do it. Um, but, you know, for the rest of the OEMs, it's never really been... Uh, available. And then two, Android, iOS is not a competitive market, right? If you want to you know, have iMessages and iTunes and iCloud and, and use your apps, there's one hardware vendor you go to. And so just in the economic sense, that's a, that's, that's a monopoly market, right? It's like there's only one choice for you to go to, right? Android, there's a lot of choice. That's actually the point of Android, right? Um, that's why it was open source. That's why we let allow uh, OEMs to customize it. That's why, you know, we can do things like what we're doing now with Robin and Smart Storage, right? Uh, but because of that, it's open market pricing, right? So, you know, I think trying to match prices and saying, well, a high-end phone should be 
$800 because that's what Apple charges. It's kind of always been the wrong strategy, right, for the OEMs, just because uh, it's possible for Apple to do that. It doesn't necessarily mean Android OEMs can or should do that, right? It's not, I think what you're seeing with the OnePlus and Xiaomi and what we're trying to do is just a little bit more honesty, like, you know, hey, you know, this is, we're not trying to pad a lot of margin into this. We just, we need to like keep the lights on um, uh, and, and like get things going. But beyond that, like this is pretty much as cheap as we can make it. Like, you know, and, and, and you know, I think, that honesty more than the price point itself is actually the refreshing part for consumers. You know, so there's kind of a lot, it's just, we can talk about it. We can be like, yeah, it's the 808 process, you know, it's like, it's expensive, right? We have fingerprint sensor, we have NFC, USB type C, you know, dual front facing uh, speakers with dual amps. Like, you know, we can be like, this is why the phone is a premium phone. That's why it's not like under, you know, under 300, right? It's in the three to 400 band, which we think all these phones kind of stand, the, the high end of the phones is and should be, right? Uh, and we think among them, you know, uh, we've got a pretty fresh design that hopefully people like. Uh, we've, I think we checked all the boxes in terms of specs, right? Getting the fingerprint NFC and USB and, you know, everything else. Uh, quality camera, everything that we've kind of invested in. So we think we check all the boxes to, to be able to, to be in that, that price range. But we also think we stand out with the design, uh, with some of the choices we made, and with the software, obviously, more than anything. Oh, don't do that to me. Don't do that to me. <laughs> no, I, I, I got to say, you guys did a phenomenal job in terms of the, the industrial design. I think that the phone looks gorgeous. I think that the color options are great. Um, and, and I really, like, it's been a while since I've seen, like I mentioned Ryan, it's been a while since I've seen he and Peter uh, get uh, get really excited about something. And I've known Ryan for quite a long time, and, and he's, he's, a, he's a tough guy to please. Nice. Huh. He's, a, he's a tough guy to please. So, um, my, my last question uh, as it pertains to, to hardware specifically is where you guys feel you made the biggest compromise to achieve that particular price point. Like obviously, you know, and, and I got to say too, the, the honesty aspect is so refreshing. You know, it's something that, like you said, I think is becoming more and more common. Um, and, and, and that's important. I think that's what we're, we're seeing right now. It's one of the things that we try really hard to do here at Techno Buffalo and, and we try and be human. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we're just people using phones and you guys want to make the best one you can make. So, like I said, where did you guys have to make the biggest compromise to hit this price point? I think the biggest compromise, honestly, was mostly for the design. When, when it was really engineering, engineering and design, we're trying to figure out how can we build it. In terms of price point, I don't know. I'm trying to think, was there something that we were really, really concerned about no, to, to be honest, I think um, there wasn't anything specifically where we're like, no, we can't have that, that's too expensive. We really did make the phone we wanted to make, right? And come hell or high water, we're going to sell it in that price band. I think the only compromises we had to make or things we kind of decisions we had to weigh against each other, a lot of it had to do with thickness, right? So, yes, people want uh, removable batteries. We totally know that, um, you know, as a thing, but you know, or wireless charging, right, which is a big feature that, you know, people ask about sometimes. But, you know, those things just with the current design wouldn't be possible without adding a bunch of thickness to the phone. So then I think a lot of, you know, any compromises we made were around this. But to be honest, we wouldn't have made them, sorry, guys, if we thought that that was, you know, like, worth it to for the phone overall. I actually think, you know, when you balance everything out, including how it looks, right, at the end of the day, because you do want, you want a phone that you kind of just think it looks awesome, right? Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I think that's at the end of the day, um, you have to make that trade off a little bit, right? And so we did that on kind of like the thickness side of things, I would say, right? Or like just keeping the, the overall shape and design. Um, you know, uh, I'll tell you a story that we, we haven't told. You know, when we originally had this, for example, we had a really hard debate about fingerprint sensor uh, because at the time when we started, it was only available on the back or front, right? And it really just wasn't comfortable with us because we knew fingerprint sensor was going to be important, you know, especially if we have it and NFC so for Android M and stuff, but it just didn't really um, fit with the design really well, right? Uh, like if we had it in the bottom, we have to remove the second speaker, we'd have to elongate the phone, on the back it just kind of stick out and it was really weird and it was really hard for us um, to decide what to do and we kind of said, you know what, we just don't think it's, it's, it's important enough, like it's important but maybe we shouldn't do it. Luckily, uh, we, we kind of pushed on the vendors and, and they, they had this side thing that they were working on, right? And we took a look at that and we we're like, oh my God, you put it on the side, right? And then we thought about it and we're like, oh, it's just where you already have your hand. Like, that's perfect. Like, you take out your phone. 
that's where your finger already is. Yes, that's freaking awesome, right? So, um, you know, we, we kind of, we're so lucky actually that this technology came out uh, just in time to be built into the device and now it's integrated with the power button. So it's literally like where your finger already goes to all the time on your phone, you know, it'll just be, it. that's where the fingerprint is. You just, and it's not a swipe, you just hold it. You just have to hold your finger there right for authentication, right? And so, so that's the, uh, that's the green. I'm sorry? That's the green area on the side? Yeah, yes, that's the fingerprint sensor slash power button, correct. So these are awesome EV units that you're seeing. So they're still early prototypes, but they're functional. And this is the power button and fingerprint sensor integrated. Yeah. Gorgeous. And I, I got to be honest, man. I, I mean, I'm not crazy about thinness. I would much rather have a slightly thicker phone and have all the features that I want. I mean, like, we, we look at the Note 5, you know, we've got giant devices in our pockets. I don't think an extra millimeter or two is going to kill us if we get it to do what we need it to do. Awesome. So. I just have one more kind of open, open-ended question for you guys that I, I really wanted you guys to kind of take and run with. I just want you to imagine for a minute that I or a viewer is a potential backer and you have one thing that a potential backer needs to know about this device or about the company. What's that one thing that you tell them? What's the most important thing that a potential backer needs to know about Nextbit and the Robin? And I think it's, it's actually different. Right. I think that's the bottom line. I think in a sea of sameness and boring and and just just general phone fatigue. Right. Um, I have this joke internally when a new phone comes up and they're like, because people email us, you know, like our, our investors are like, oh, have you seen this phone? And I just reply, yep, Y A P, which means yet another Android phone. And I'm just <laughs> like, you know, it's like yeah, it's not like this is why we can do it because it is easier than ever. Right to actually make a phone, and it's it's become like you call it democratic. That's a hard word. You know what you said. Oh, oh, it is a hard word. I can tell you firsthand <laughs> that shooting the word democratization on video is not easy. Democratization of smartphones that you mentioned, right? It's true, and that's good and bad, right? The good is it lets a lot of people try a lot of different stuff, which is great. The bad is, you know, there could be a lot of bad product out there, right? A lot. There's just a lot of me too ness. And this is not a Me Too product. From from everything, from the hardware, the colors, the you know, the kind of the features, and of course the software, right? And, and it's just the beginning on the software too, right? This storage is our launch feature. We're going to actually be doing a lot of other stuff later on, uh, and part of that will actually be engaging with the community. You'll see towards the end of the Kickstarter as well as after to kind of help you guys set the roadmap for us. Um, but we really want to you know kind of communicate and engage with the community. But we have a lot of ideas. We don't want to do anything that's just an iteration. We don't want to do anything that's a little feature. We only want to do things that will actually help you, that will actually solve a problem, and that's like a big change, right? Uh, something yeah. positive, right? I don't mean the change in like the UI, UI interaction. I mean like something that actually functionally works different, like how we've, we've changed storage around, right? Cloud storage around. So I don't know, that's yeah. my take. I don't know if you... You know, I think, uh, I guess my thing I would say is to potential backers, um, I mean, Back us if you just believe in our principles and where the company is going. And like a, a new phone company is trying to build just a super honest, transparent phone to you. But also, just from a software side, we want a phone that gets better over time, right? Smartphones should get smarter. They should be smarter than where they are today. And part of the reason why we started this company, why we're going to Kickstarter, is we were kind of thinking, why, why wait, right? We yeah. We can do this. We, you know, when when we were on the Android team originally, you know, we were underdogs in industry and within Google. So, yeah, we're we're kind of the underdogs again. But with everyone's support, we think we can we can help push the industry forward. Awesome, awesome. Well, there you have it, guys. Next bits slogan: Think different, or uh, or just do it. I don't know. Um. <laughs> you really want to know? It's. Just our longer term vision, right? It's you on any piece of glass, right? And what we want to do is eventually we think you should be able to authenticate to any smart device and just have your stuff there for you. But that's a longer conversation for me. I thought you were going to say that our, our, oh, other, actually, our, our other, other motto. motto actually, that's true. We have, I don't, sorry, <laughs> we should just say, all right, fine. Like, okay, our actual internal, like, rah rah that we say every day is uh, don't be stupid. <laughs> so that is actually our company motto internally for all our employees all the time. It's like, remember, what's our motto? Don't be stupid. <laughs>
I'm, I'm gonna, if that's okay with you guys, I'm going to go ahead and adopt that as my motto as well. All right, yeah. go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I hope this has been a blast for our viewers. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you guys had a great time learning about the next bit robin if you enjoyed this video go ahead and hit that like button and you can hit that subscribe button down below as well if you would like mike and tom to personally come to your home with a robin with your name engraved on it which they will definitely not do i just made that up sorry guys <laughs> tom, tom's gonna be the one to do it and i think i think mike and tom will will join me in uh encouraging you guys and urging you guys to be kind to one another in the comments be kind to each other thank you guys for watching and i'll catch you guys in the next video thank, thank you. you thank you so much